Hello. Now, these are the end times. These are perilous times. So I want you to give me a few minutes and let us discuss some things that are absolutely important, matters of life and death, things that could affect your own generations and mine as well. Now, you must agree with me looking at the whole world right now that these are the days when we need the peace of God that passes all understanding to keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And the counsel that God gives, which is the first thing I want us to establish as a parameter, is the Bible says that finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, they are just, whatever things are pure, the things that are lovely, whatever things are of good report. Bible says if there's any virtue, is there any praise? Bible says these are the things that we need to meditate upon. So what does this mean? Watch out for these days carefully to guard your heart that anything that you hear that is not honest, it's not true, it's not lovely, it's not pure, it's not of good report, be careful about these things and don't just let them into your sphere of influence as a believer, lest they affect you adversely. Now, having said that, it is still the duty of every believer to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. But even in that contention, you must remember that straight is the gate and narrow is that path that leads to life. And one of the reasons where there are a few that find the right path is because Satan creates all sorts of diversions, roadblocks, distractions, alternatives, and all sorts of juicy, luscious offers that almost look like the original, but are not quite the original. So in a sense... If you want your children's children, if you want to be established to the end, if you want that peace of God that passes all understanding in your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus, you must be ready to apply digital precision to your faith. Now, Nigeria is a nation with huge potentials. The hand of the Lord is on this nation. He has sent prophet after prophet, apostle after apostle into Nigeria. And um, one that readily comes to mind is past Sidney Elton. I tell you something, God has invested a lot in Nigeria. And it is just natural that there would also be a lot of challenges to the destiny of Nigeria. Now, while these challenges must come, there are certain challenges that will come, that do not fall under the good report, that are not lovely. Some of these things are just odious, and some of these things are just terrible. So how does God plan for us to deal with issues like that? As a matter of fact, I will tell you something, that if we want to stay spiritual and scriptural, uh, as far back as the year 2012, we released... Um, uh, we released a bulletin, a publication. Uh, it was titled The Apostolic Showdown. The Apostolic Showdown. We had announced then that there would be an apostolic showdown in the days to come. Now, an apostolic showdown is a spiritual encounter that is similar to the prophesied, what we call the Day of the Lord. Because it is a time of great visitation, but cleansing, rebuke, and restoration as well. The Bible says, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? In the same vein, the apostolic showdown, they are ignited to maintain purity of doctrine and destroy demonic devices. Now, having said that, I want you to know that the apostolic platform is a high office that comes with great honor. But apostolic showdowns have been established by God so that the average believer can stay the course. Now, listen to this. The apostolic office is a high office, has great honor. 
But this also comes with challenges. And the defining factor of true apostleship is a very daunting qualification. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9 to 13. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted. And have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our own hands. Being reviled we bless. Being persecuted we suffer. Being defamed we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. And are the offscoring of all things unto this day. Listen to me. The challenges of the apostolic platform are such that nobody in their right mind would desire it except for the ignorant and maybe satanic agents. You see, wise men generally resist the apostolic title and they only surrender to it for the greater good of God's kingdom and its expansion. Nigeria is a nation that is destined for greatness in God's divine timetable. Now, this distinction has attracted a rash of fake apostles whose God is their belly, Though genuine apostles know the mind of God and operate the mind of Christ with unerring accuracy, but the human element also means that apostles can be corrupted and when care is not taken, it is a dangerous situation when apostles become corrupted because the residue of the anointing makes it a hazardous task for the average believer to challenge the errors of the apostolic platform without suffering some collateral damage. What I'm trying to point out to you is this. When God picks his staff, his personal staff, not because they are better than anybody else, but when he equips the apostle, the prophet, the teacher, the pastor, and the evangelist, when he equips the people in the ministry of helps, those with gifts of government and all that, he does it supernaturally. And there are certain things that come with those offices. Now, we're not talking about even fake apostles here. Those ones are so easy to dispense with. The big challenge in the destiny of a nation are apostles that go rogue. And when an apostle goes rogue, it's not easy. Now, remember that right there in the Bible, we have the example of uh, Elisha, who took the double portion of Elijah. While Elisha was still familiarizing himself with the office, the prophetic office, Instinctively, in a very rash moment, he spoke hastily. 42 children died by reason of the unction which was given for that office. Now, this is the reason why I tell you that the apostolic showdown is something that we need to break down for you from scriptures, show you how it works, so that there will be no collateral damage. Because there are some young people, for instance, young believers. There are certain things that will happen when you see, you know, older prophets, younger prophets, older apostles and all that, even when they've gone rogue. Challenging them, correcting these errors is not something that God just leaves to just anybody to do. The truth is, there will always be collateral damage because some of those offices come with giftings that cannot be denied. I want to remind you about the story in 1 Kings chapter 13. The old prophet and the younger prophet. Look, the, uh, the young prophet died. He was buried by the old prophet. An old prophet that had already gone rogue, had missed it completely, but still full of tricks. And because this old prophet was full of tricks, there are certain manipulations that he made in the life of the young prophet. The young prophet was derailed and he ended up missing it completely. And it was the old prophet that even came to bury him. So what am I saying? It is more economical for God to send apostles to correct erring apostles in order to preserve the purity of the gospel. So there are biblical
typical apostolic showdowns. You see, the modern Christian is hardly aware that Paul had an apostolic showdown with Apostle Peter. This almost sounds like sacrilege to the Nigerian heir. More so when you find out that Peter was an apostle who walked with Jesus and Paul was a Johnny come lately. So in Nigerian parlance, we'll believe that Peter was a senior. Bible says, but when Peter was come into Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to blame. To make matters worse, it was an open confrontation. Galatians chapter 2 verse 14. But when I saw they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you being a Jew live after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Look, this matter ended up well because the two men involved were submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and both of them understood apostolic protocols. Here we have a Johnny just come lately apostle in the name of, uh, of Paul, formerly Saul, who used to be a murderer, a Boko Haram, who now had the temerity and had the, the, he, he, had, he had the chutzpah to stand up and start correcting apostles who had been there with Jesus in the days of his flesh. But watch what I'm saying. Both of these apostles, whether one was senior or junior or senior both apostles or whatever it is that Africans like to put, both of them realized that there was one person that they were both submitted to and that person was the most high God. And because of this, the fear of God prevailed. Because the fear of God prevailed, it ended well. Now, instead of sparking a denominational war the way it would in Africa, things were sorted out to glorify God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. And the account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. This is Peter making a comment. Which those who are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter was commending Paul. Later on, Peter, who was rebuked openly in front of other apostles, was the one who took the rebuke, made the correction, and later on, he was making a reference to the apostolic showdown that he had earlier on had with, quote, his junior. He did this with maturity. So what am I trying to conclude for you? There is nothing strange about apostolic showdowns. There is nothing strange about the apostolic showdown. The only thing is that the apostolic showdown must follow apostolic protocols. The only thing about the apostolic showdown is that it is not a showdown that that just you know involves the whole loy poloi. And just every Sikuru, James, and, uh, and Jackiru. Now listen to this. But for the assurance of God and an abundance of revelation, the genuine apostle would almost feel that he was appointed to suffer and to endure much adversity, persecution, death threats, and suffering are a normal part of the apostolic diet. Because they represent the cutting edge of the kingdom advance. Apostles are sticklers for spiritual exactitudes and they cannot stand deviations from the standard of scripture. For instance, the Galatian church (laughs) supplies another witness that ratifies the apostolic showdown as a biblical norm for open rebuke when needed. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of of Christ, you are moved there from there onto another gospel, which is not another gospel, 
but there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. Do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What am I saying? Words of Paul. The apostolic showdown is scriptural. I'm going to tell you something. If you go back into Nigerian Pentecostal history, there have been apostolic showdowns before. But they were conducted based on apostolic protocols. Now hear this. The apostolic ministry of Pa Josiah Akindami 1909 to 1980, warned the Nigerian church that fake apostles and backslidden ministers could end up easily derailing and they can be identified by their fruit. Many Nigerian believers will be shocked to listen to some of the teachings of Pa Josiah Akinami because if you look at some of the excesses on the Nigerian pulpit today that have become the norm, you'll be shocked that Pa Akidami spoke about all these things in the days of his flesh. Now, the equation of gain to godliness is one of such transgressions. The equation of gain to godliness, or now interpreting gain as godliness, is one of these things. Now, don't forget I said to you that the apostolic office is a dangerous one. This is an office where men who are accustomed to death threats, they are accustomed to sufferings, they are accustomed to both being base and abounding. These are men you cannot move on a good day with the things of the world. So you'll find out that Pa Kinda Army, if you listen to his apostolic ministrations, laid out a lot of warnings for the Nigerian church. By their fruit, you shall know them. So, if you go around the pulpits of Nigeria today and you see the equation of gain to godliness, actually these are things that are worthy of an apostolic showdown. Let me look for another one. The financial charge attached to salvation in any disguise is another abomination. I'm talking here about uh, uh, redemption of firstborn. You see, when you enter into what we call the apostolic protocols, it teaches us to know the difference between what the Bible calls weightier matters. Weightier matters and the peripherals. Apostolic showdowns are concerned about weightier matters. You see, a minister that strains as a gnat while swallowing a camel cannot engage in an apostolic showdown. Just as you cannot ignore a log in your own eye, and ran over a speck of dust in somebody else's eye. Pa Akida Amini's day definitely carried an apostolic burden for the Nigerian church and the gospel of the kingdom of God. But one thing that you would note is that he had such a compassion and his words were laced with love, care, and concern even when he began to lay down apostolic showdown principles. Another fellow is Pa Sidney Elton, I mentioned, who was born in 1840 in England. Believe it or not, he was also an apostolic father in the nurture of the Nigerian Pentecostal Church. He served from 1937 to 1987 in Nigeria. When he died and was buried in Nigeria, his apostolic mantle was the one that had nurtured most of the fathers of the Nigerian Pentecostal Church. And most believers today have never heard his name because partly he initiated an apostolic showdown after he cited some divisions from God's original plan for the Nigerian Pentecostal revival. Listen to me. Archbishop Ben Dahosa had a special place in the heart of Pa Elton, Sidney Elton. Archbishop Ben Dahosa actually connected him because he had seen a vision and went to look for him and became a protege of Pa Sidney Elton. 
Pastor D. Alton became like a father figure who helped a lot in the ministry of Archbishop Benson Nahusa. But listen to this. Their relationship of Lord did not deter them from having an apostolic showdown as Archbishop Benson grew. In 1981, it's on record that they gave the microphone to Pa Elton to speak. And they said to the people, listen, people are here, cars are here, but the owner of the church, that is, Jesus Christ, is not here. Pa Elton said that openly. He said, you have people here, you have cars, you have money, but he is not here. Benson the Hosa took the rebuke in good faith. Today, there's no fuss made about it because this is something that was said openly. This was a chastisement coming from a father figure. This was coming from an apostle of, of, of weight to another apostle who understood apostolic protocols. And there was no big deal about it, apart from maybe taking as much correction as possible to move on. Now, let me tell you something more about Pastor Sidney Elton. By the 1980s, <laughs> he was certain that the Nigerian Pentecostal Church had missed it and a new kingdom move of God would have to be revived. And he said, the Pentecostal churches are going to hate us because they'll say they've got what we are preaching. They taught it. I taught them. I know. They can't argue with me because I taught them. But they've lost it. They are the only Pentecostals in name. They've lost it. But because we go and preach what they said they've got and they've lost, we are exposing them. They'll lose their people. And that's what they're afraid of. They'll lose their business and it's money that's involved. But we are prepared for that. Pa Elton held the Nigerian church responsible for not preventing the Biafran war. His words have since gained credence because the Goliath Pentecostal Church of Nigeria has been unable to stem even the tide of corruption or stop the rivers of blood that is being shed by religious terrorism today. Now, there is a predator prey dynamic in Nigeria. Predatorial prey dynamic. Pa Altim foresaw all these things and spoke about them. And that's why we had not even known that, well, in the place of prayer, in the year 2012, we had pointed out that if Nigeria is ever going to move forward, there would have to be an apostolic showdown. But my insistence is this, when I look at what is going on, I can see that it is brewing and the year 2019 is probably going to be the year in which the apostolic showdown is going to happen. However, to minimize collateral damage so that the people who shouldn't be affected adversely should not be affected. Those who have no business in getting involved in an apostolic showdown should not get involved lest they lose a lot. There's a predator prey dynamic in Nigeria. It's alarming that everything from Boko Haram and politics to religion in Nigeria presently runs on that predator prey principle, mark of the beast. Time and space will not permit us, but this is a dynamic that is strong part of the end time, mark of the beast strategy of Satan. We must be careful to ensure that the church does not run on the same principle as other institutes that are susceptible to the mark of the beast. Listen to me. The mark of the beast works whether you are a predator or a prey. Check this out. The Soviet novelist Chinggis Aymatov recounted a story in one of his articles that was written near the end of the field Marxist movement in Soviet Union in 1935. Stalin invited his trusted senior advisors and some media henchmen to a meeting. When he invited them to that meeting, it was with the intention to make a point using the most evocative of methods. Stalin called for a live chicken and proceeded to use it to make an unforgettable point before some of his henchmen. Forcefully clutching the chicken in one hand, with the other, he began to systematically pluck out its feathers, painfully. As the chicken struggled in vain to escape, he continued with the painful denuding until the bird was completely stripped. Now you watch, Stalin said, as he placed the chicken on the floor and walked away with some breadcrumbs in his hand. Incredibly, the fear-crazed chicken hobbled towards Stalin and clung to the legs of his trousers. Stalin threw a handful of grain to the bird, 
and began to follow him around the room. He turned to his dumbfounded colleagues and said quietly, This is the way you rule people. Did you see how that chicken followed me for food? Even though I had caused it such torture, people are like that chicken. If you inflict inordinate pain on them, they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. Now, the big question is whether the Nigerian church, Pentecostal church, has absorbed such strategies or not. Because they fall under the strategy of the mark of the beast for the end time, even if it has been done unknowingly. Now, let me now comment at this point in time, because a whole lot of phone calls have been coming in. A good number of people um, have called me because in the years past, all through these years, they've heard me comment seriously the ministry of uh, Pastor Sunday Adelaja. They've heard me talk about his books. They've I've called other fellow ministers and I said, look, I've been to Ukraine once, twice, thrice. I want a whole lot of you to pay attention. I think there's something good that God is doing over there, and there's some things that we must learn from it. Although I must confess that I privately used to ruminate, and I used to ask God that if a man at such a young age, you've used him with your gospel to move an entire nation the way you used Sunday Adilaja in the Ukraine, I used to ponder to myself, Lord, what will this man do for the rest of his life if he has attained unto that so early? And um, I remember that I used to be a bit apprehensive about that. So there are many ministers who are calling on us right now, asking questions, and I can tell you that, oh yes, uh, Apostle uh, Sunday Adelaja is really an apostle, but people have been drawing my attention to his audacious what he calls the Elijah uh, challenge. Now here again, all I can just tell people is that I want to refer everybody, especially ministers of the gospel, to the guidelines or the apostolic protocols for apostolic showdowns. Now, is this an apostolic showdown? This is Elijah call, especially when he's calling out a lot of Nigerian ministers, he's calling out a lot of names and so on and so forth. People want to know. Now, this is my own take. I always believe that uh, let God be true and let every man be a liar. I can tell you that Nigeria is a country that has very great importance before God. So we have a lot of challenges. Now, some of our challenges come from people who even hate to hear the name of Jesus Christ. So from the apostolic platform, I can also tell you from within Nigeria that we have challenges from without and we also have some challenges from within. But when it comes to this Elijah challenge, the, what I can just say is this, is that the first thing that I noticed, uh, that I have to admit, is that yes, there's a room for apostolic showdown in Nigeria, but the rules of engagement must help us to judge wisely. First of all, I want to say that the Elijah challenge conjures an imagery that cannot line up with scripture. Because every joining apostolic platform knows that the one that answers by fire is not an acceptable proof today. Calling for ministers to answer by fire is not an acceptable proof of godliness today. And any minister, any minister that is stupid enough to so do must be a satanic agent. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth. In the sight of men, and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. <laughs> now, beyond that, I believe that the Nigerian Pentecostal Church, that, that was scripture for you, and for those who don't know it, if you go back into the Bible, it is actually not the genuine ministers of God today who are calling for what Elijah did. Actually, it's the false prophets, it's the beast, it's the symbol. Go to the book of Revelation and go and study it yourself. Any minister who today is calling for fire in the open and is able to do it successfully, instead of applauding him, if you are smart, you need to put a Bible between yourself and such a minister quickly. Because the Bible has warned that it can only do that in the sight of the beast and the false prophet. 
Now, the Pentecostal church in Nigeria has absorbed so much pollution that we actually have room now for an apostolic showdown. Now, the first question is whether Sunday Adelaide is addressing weightier matters, Matthew 23, 23, weightier matters or not. You see, weightier matters are the ones that affect core doctrines of Christ and practices that are destructive to God's kingdom in Nigeria. Weightier matters affect core doctrines. That's why you found out that Apostle Paul, when he was talking to Galatian church, because he was talking about a weightier matter, another gospel, another spirit, uh, 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 another Jesus. If anybody's allowed to go after another Jesus, another gospel, and another doctrine, they will end up in hell for eternity. And that's the reason why if it is a weightier matter, it can be addressed in the open. So the first poser is, the issues that are being addressed by Apostle Sunday Adelaide, are they weightier matters that warrant an apostolic showdown? Now, this is the second one. Can it be true that the Pentecostal church in Nigeria is luring people to worship God rather than mammon? This would warrant an apostolic showdown. Is there something going on within the country? Are people being diverted away from the worship of God, doing away from the straight and the narrow path that leads to life? Has the pulpit been polluted with a weightier matter? Listen, God said something plainly, which he never even gave such honor to Satan. God said you cannot worship God and mammon. Now, the worship of mammon is something that's very surreptitious, but it's also very, very addictive. And this is one of the things that I know that apostles are very careful of. So we need to weigh the issues. Are the issues he's talking about, do they fall into weightier matters, number one? Is it a matter of mammon which has been singled out by God? Now, the third one that we need to look at is, is this. Is the Apostle Sunday of Eucain, is he motivated by divine love? Or is he an opportunist seeking some ulterior motive? Now, the fourth question was also centered on what we call his methodology and timing. Now, his method and timing, do they align with apostolic protocols? Are they based on God's wisdom? Or is it a zealous indignation? My fifth question, we need to look at the fruit of the campaign. If we look at the fruit of that campaign, its conduct and the early fruit it's showing, will it increase the value of human worth in Nigeria ultimately? Will it decrease corruption? Will it turn the hearts of the sons back to the fathers? We must look at this thing. The sixth is this, and this is a very important one, because I know that the Nigerian church really needs this in particular. Is Pastor Sunday Adelaide employing the mind of Christ? Or is he powered by a zeal based on the intelligence of men because of indignation to address a glaring problem? Listen, looking at Pastor Sunday Adelaide's testimony broadly, there is no doubt about the apostolic status that he has. But that will not exempt him from apostolic protocols. If he destroys apostolic protocols while sitting in the office of the apostle, the consequences will be there. And it will only create a whole lot of confusion in an already challenged and bad situation in Nigeria. Hear what I'm saying? Our considerations must not be cultural. They must not be temporal. They must be kingdom-based. And above all, let us remember that he that must speak, let him speak. 
as the oracles of God. God bless you and have a lovely 2019.